100% go for it. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the GeoDiv second online lecture. My name is Brent Marquides. I'm a committee member with the GeoDiv responsible for organizing these lectures. Today's online lecture will focus on site investigation, Easter eggs, secrets, as well as some hot tips. Myself, I'm pretty interested to find out what will be said about Easter eggs. Before we start the lecture, I just want to run through the program for today. Dr. Vermeulen will shortly give his presentation. Unlike our previous online lecture, where we held the Q&A till the end of the session, we will in fact open the Q&A from the beginning. After each of Nico's sections, you will be able to post questions to Nico. We will moderate and respond to those questions as we can. New to this online lecture, we will have a bit of an interactive section where you can take part in a live quiz or questionnaire, but Dr. Femulin will give more info during the presentation. In total, we've allowed about 90 minutes for today's session. Just as a bit of interest, this online lecture had over 250 RSVPs. I think that's really awesome. Okay, I think most of you already know Dr. Femulin and he probably needs no introduction. But for those of you who don't know him, Nico Femulin grew up on a gold mine on the West Rand gold fields in the 70s and 80s. From an early age, he showed an interest in mechanics and computers. During school holidays, he could be found in the mine planning offices, developing Lotus 123 spreadsheet solutions to optimize mine development. It was therefore no surprise that he completed a master's degree in computational geotechnical engineering in 1994, and then went on to obtain his PhD in 2001 on the state and composition of gold mine tailings. Prof. Ivan Risp played an instrumental role in cultivating a lifelong passion for tailings and testings of soils. Nico served as a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria in 1995. As fate would have it, in his first year, he lectured to a number of students who have since become key engineers and directors of Jones and Wagner. He later joined the Jones and Wagner geotechnical team in 2002, along with Peter Day and Gavin Wardle. Nico remains an academic at heart. He presents regular in-house training lectures dealing with topics ranging from critical, soil, critical state soil mechanics, numerical methods, advanced use of spreadsheets and programming, to philosophy and even Einstein's theory of relativity. Nico is an ex registered professional engineer and is also registered as a UK chartered engineer with the ICE. He is currently pursuing certification as an arbitrator and is a member of the Association of Arbitrators in Southern Africa. He has developed a keen interest in engineering dispute resolution and forensic geotechnics. To balance his professional and family life, he works hard to perfect his somewhat diverse hobbies, including Meccano construction, Lego robotics, and competitive online gaming. And with that, and with the hope that we won't have any load shedding, touch wood, I hand over to Dr. Femulin. Thank you, Brett, uh, and thank you for the to the Geotech Division for having me this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be presenting it on a topic that is very close to my heart, and I hope that this afternoon I will be able to share with you uh, something old, something current, and, and hopefully something new that will be of value to all of you. Uh, as Brett said, uh, I would like to do this slightly different to the normal way of presenting, and, and that's by way of the fact that I'm sitting here in front of my computer screen and I, can, and I have no feedback or interaction with, with you as the audience. Uh, fortunately, we can uh, allow questions and comments to come through via the, the chat function. And uh, I've discovered this magic little button in the settings of Teams that allow audience uh, interaction that is uh, appropriate clapping of hands and cheering at the right times. So with all of that in place, hopefully this will go down quite smoothly. So the presentation will be presented in two platforms. The first is just a normal PowerPoint presentation, which makes up the, the main, main, main part of the, the, the proceedings to this afternoon. 
But secondly, I've also added a, um, a Mentimeter platform. And that will allow you as um, the audience to participate. Now, originally my, my intention was to bring the interactive parts into the presentation at, uh, at appropriate times, but um, I am aware of the fact that there is a slight delay because this is a live uh, event. So to try and circumvent some of the problems that we might end up with, uh, I've decided to do all the live or the interactive parts bits up front and then I will bring in, as you will see later, the results uh, as we go through the main presentation. So without further ado, um, hopefully on your screen soon you will get an information page that uh, gives you the website ad address for Mentimeter, worldwideweb.menti.com. And if you wish to participate, you can log into that website via any available platform. If you've got dual screen on your PC, you can use one of the screens and a separate web page to log in. You can also do it on a tablet, smartphone or laptop. If you go to that website and you enter today's code 906197, you will get access to the uh, platform to allow you to provide feedback. Now, shortly I will run through seven questions uh, on, on the presentation and I invite you to then provide your answers and feedback with, with that, that platform. Um, I will then close down the Mentimeter side of things and run the main presentation. And when we get to where the questions fit into the main presentation, I will hopefully be able to bring up uh, the, the feedback from yourselves and we can have a look at what you as the audience have to say about these topics. Now, it's not a, a meant to be a serious quiz or questionnaire or exam of any type. It's meant to be a little bit of fun and, and to gauge reaction and, 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 and your opinion about certain of these things. So first question up is, and I would just like to open the voting, there we go, is I would like you to give me your opinion of what a box standard simple geotechnical investigation should cost and how long should it take to be able to, to present the results to the client. Um, and I've said in terms of assumptions, let's assume this is like a fancy residential development of about 10 million Rand on the Archean uh, granite ge geology. And we're just going to limit this now to test pitting and laboratory testing. So you have two scales on the horizontal scale, the cost in 10,000 Rand units, and you can go up to 150,000, I think, and duration, the same thing, one to 15 weeks of duration. So voting is open. As soon as you get this on your, your side of the platform, you're welcome to enter your answers to these questions. And then later on, I'm hoping to bring up this very same slide and to show the outcome of your voting. <clears throat> I'm going to keep the voting open on this one and introduce the next slide. Uh, you should have the option to, once you've uh, added your vote on question one, to proceed to question two. In the second part of my presentation, I'm going to look at um, some desktop activities as part of the, the site investigation process. And what I would like from you is to rank or prioritize the list of activities that I've provided in the question there. And you have a total of 100 points that you can allocate um, amongst those various activities. So the, ones of, the one that obviously gets the most points allocated to it should drift up to the top of the list and vice versa towards the bottom of the list. I will keep the voting open. So if you are able to page to the different questions, you should still be able to add your feedback um, while I continue on to the next uh, questions. My third question and what we will also be looking at uh, as part of our site investigation practice and the law is I would like you to estimate in your opinion, what is the value of a human life? Uh, in, in statistical terms, this is known as the, the statistical value 
of a human life. And I've given you the options there at the bottom end of the scale, less than a million US dollars, and at the top end of the scale, exceeding 20 million US dollars. And you'll see later on where this factors in when we look at our relationship uh, with the law and with legislation. Um, I see some feedback, a question asking whether this uh, quiz is anonymous. I believe that you have the option. The default is that uh, it is an anon anonymous, but you're also welcome if you want to, to add personal details or your name there. But I think by default, you would you get an uh, allocated an, an anonymous identity in answering these questions. Next question, question four. Um, is also still on the topic of the law and site investigations. And the question here is, Legally, how deep are you allowed as a geotechnical practitioner to enter into an excavation, and that would typically be a despot, without providing bracing or shoring to that excavation and without battering the side walls of this excavation to a sta stable angle? This is a question that has come up many times, and over the past decades, the legal requirements have changed. So my question to you is currently, what is the legal maximum depth that you're allowed to enter into a test pit without providing shoring or battering? A normal standard test pit investigation for profiling in and sampling in situ. All right, another question has just popped up. How do we access uh, Mentimeter? Uh, on each of these slides at the top, you'll get the website address, www.menti.com, where you can just add the, uh, the code 906197, also displayed at the top of the slide, and you should be able to access uh, the, the, the quiz. Moving on to question five, uh, and um, still looking at our relationship with the law, my question is, as a geopractitioner carrying out site investigations, are you liable for civil actions? In other words, actions in contract. Are you liable for civil actions outside of contract? In other words, in delict. Uh, and, and delict means here it's uh, something that you do conduct that is done that is wrongful and in our terms normally is measured against either intentional wrongfulness or negligent wrongfulness. Third option there, are we criminal, criminally liable? And then lastly, maybe a little bit of an outlier, uh, are we exposing ourselves to a life sentence or in the worst case, uh, death penalty and possible execution? Moving on to question six, and now we are into the act of test pitting. Um, one of the sections that I will be looking at is test pitting, as this is one of the main activities that we generally undertake. And my question to you is, when you get to site and you get out of that bucky and put foot on ground, what is the one thing that you have left or found yourself to have commonly often left at home? What is that one item that you go, oh man, I left this at the office or at home. And then my very last question, we look at one of our common site investigation tools, something that should be part of your standard toolbox, and that's the dynamic cone penetrometer or the DCP, or as some of the older people will refer to it as the CBR penetrometer. My question to you is, what have you used the DCP for in the past? As a, as a site investigation tool, have you used this to determine in situ CBR, bearing capacity for footings, for stiffness uh, estimates and settlement calculations, 
to classify subgrade layers or even pile design. And I, I, as I believe that you, you can select multiple of these options. So have you used the DCP for any of those activities as part of your, your practice as a geotechnical engineer or engineering geologist? I'm going to keep the voting open and then we'll return to these sheets uh, once we get to the appropriate place in the main presentation. Uh, if you've missed out on it, don't worry. It's meant to be a little bit of fun and interactive participation. I'm now going to switch back to the main presentation and uh, carry on from there. Right, so the contents of the talk today, uh, as you may have guessed from these questions, are going to look at topics such as the planning, design and procurement of site investigations, the part of the investigation that we do in the office, the, the desk study. We're going to look at walkover surveys of a site, then look at our relationship with the law, the act of test pitting as a site investigation practice, and then lastly, we can have a look at sampling for laboratory testing. Adjacent to this talk is a sister presentation or sister lecture that then goes on to the further topics of laboratory testing, institute testing and also instrumentation. Now to make things a bit more interesting, um, I've tried to allocate these icons in the slides uh, where I believe they, they are relevant and uh, they tie into the main uh, topic or title of the, the presentation for today. So a thumbs up I'm going to give to what I consider to be a hot tip or a rule of thumb. Now in the second presentation on laboratory testing and site investigation as institute testing, these rules of thumb play a far greater role. But even in today's presentations, there will be occasional points uh, that I will highlight as, a, as let's say a hot tip. Then uh, good reads or what I consider to be essential references for your geotechnical library. Uh, as Brett mentioned, those Easter eggs, eggs, which I consider to be best kept secrets. Some pearls of wisdom, hopefully. Food for thought, something to consider and ponder um, what impact this may have on your practice and the way that you do site investigations. And then lastly, the cans of worms. And we're going to have a few of those. And because they are such uh, a Pandora's box of trouble, we are not going to open those, although we're just going to highlight them for interest. Okay, moving on to the planning, design and procurement aspects. I would like to start off with this quotation from the 19th century, essentially by John Rushkin, and it applies to business and it applies very much to our business of geotechnical engineering. And I invite you to read the whole of the quote, but I'm just going to read the highlighted sentence uh, stating the following. The common law of business balance prohibits paying a little and getting a lot. It can't be done. And I think nowhere is this statement more true than in geotechnical engineering as a science and the practice of site investigations. You cannot get a decent proper and adequate site investigation by paying too little for it. So what is the moral of the story? I think one of the problems that we face is that if you are an investor or a developer, you're going through this line sort of trend of argument. So first of all, if you have money, you can make money. And property development under normal conditions or circumstances is certainly an attractive option. Not only do you procure a fixed asset with the potential for growth over time, but you can also gener generate rental income from it. For you, the only thing to worry about is location, location, and location. This thing that's called a geotechnical investigation, what is it? What a waste of time and money. I, can I see it? Can I sell it? No. And this is where the problem starts. Now, interesting enough, whether you at a developer or a geotech pr practitioner, it's all about the CBRs. If you're the developer or the investor, your CBR is the cost benefit ratio. You have money and over time you can generate return on your investment. That's what's important to you. As a geotechnical engineer or practitioner, you also have CBRs. 
California bearing ratio. You look at stress and strain and translate that into a serviceability or failure state or design. And you have to consider problem ground conditions. The challenge, however, is that these metrics or units are not compatible. And that's where things go wrong. Now, throw into all this mix those uh, events called black swan events that are rare and unexpected occurrences that have a massive and global impact on the economy. Um, it makes things all a lot more interesting. And I thought I'd just throw in this slide just to show um, as of March this year that already the impact of the coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic is already comparable to some of the greatest disasters over the past 50 years. We can see there standing out was the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Um, the center of the dots, they show the, 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 the percentage of sell off on the, on the S&P uh, 500 share market. And the outer ring on the circle shows how long it took the market to recover from that black swan event. So that global financial crisis had almost a 60% sell off in market share and took more than a thousand days for the economy to recover from it. As of March, we can see already COVID-19 has had a impact of 30% of sell off and it's completely unknown how long its impact is going to be felt by the economy before we back to the state where we were. But let's um, focus on something more normal. And um, I've took the, liber the liberty of uh, using an example that was presented by uh, Tim Chapman of Arab. And I've tried in my slides uh, to provide you all the references and web links wherever possible. So Tim's uh, hypothetical example is actually a comparison of the CBRs. Uh, it's relevant to the year 2001, uh, which is now very long ago, but I think it still provides relevant uh, information in terms of the situation, even at, as it stands today. The idea here is that you are an investor with about 100 million pounds and you're looking at how to generate income or return from it. On the right hand side, the option is to invest in, in a bank institution, maybe a bank deposit, a fixed interest loan or even equities. You compare that on the left against a property type investment. And in this case, we look at the hypothetical situation where the old building of uh, Scotland Yard in London was reaching its end of its uh, economical life, uh, profitable life. Uh, it was getting on to 30 years old at 16,000 square, square meters of, of office space and was up for sale at the cost of about 70 million pounds. So looking at the, uh, the CBR there, it was a no brainer at the time that uh, the best option there was to invest in this property, buy the land and renovate or redevelop the office space into a modern building that then becomes rentable and hopefully will also increase its value. Now, the numbers and the tables presented in these slides were developed by, by Tim and uh, there's a lot of background. And if you get the original publication, uh, you'll be able to follow where all the numbers are generated from. I just want to highlight a few aspects of this. Now, first of all, I want to show you how disproportionate the risk is. Uh, but before I show the data, I want to relate a story. And this was when I attended my very first geotechnical division meeting, and it was held at the offices of SRK many, many years ago. And this very topic was discussed at the time, and it seems it will be discussed forever and after. And I remember Hollings Norton then, while he was still in South Africa, standing up in the meeting. And this is the, the lasting impression I had from that, that discussion. And he was disgusted by the fact that a new building that was built in the in central Joburg, and I think it was a, a banking development, that the budget of the interior designer of the foyer of this bank was greater than the budget for the entire foundation solution. And I'm pretty sure that included the basement at the time. And I always thought to myself that, you know, that just does, doesn't sound right. Can it be? And here are the numbers to show exactly what Hollings said at the time. So this gives us a little bit of a scale of proportion of costs. Now, remember, we had um, 
the, the cost of that property was about 70 million pounds, and we can spend another 30 million on building costs. Of that 30 million, we can look at the development is made up of the substructure cost. That's about 7% of it. Then the building, the structure, the frame, floor, walls, and roof is another 35% of that cost. And lo and behold, highlighted in yellow there, the finishes and services amounts to exactly the same percentage of the building cost as the structure itself, another 35%. And then add to that another 23% of fit out, and that makes up the 30 million construction cost of redeveloping this building into a new lettable um, asset. Of that 7% of the substructure cost, that is made up of 73% uh, spent on the basement structure, 25% spent on the piles and the pile caps, and a meager 2% on the site investigation. Now, if we work this back to the original building cost, that site investigation at 40,000 pounds makes up about 0 0.2, and that's being generous, 0.2% of the cost of the building of that 30 million. Now let's look at the risk. So the top part there summarized the cost. That's the purchase price, about 70, the building uh, development cost, about 30 million. Should a one month delay be incurred? The additional cost associated with that could be as much as almost 600,000 in interest for financing this project, maybe another 150,000 for the main contractors for costs, uh, additional investigations, redesign and reworking of the, the, the building, and maybe another 60,000 for changes to the foundations themselves, the poles. If we ignore the other additional costs, and these can be significant, these costs are costs associated, uh, they are consequential costs, costs associated with loss of production, and that could be massive. Uh, missing something like a property rental cycle or even a critical season such as the Christmas holidays. And also ignoring the costs associated with dispute and legal costs. This translates to a potential loss and, and what, what Tim did is he said, let's say a 40,000 pound investigation, let's skimp on that. And let's say we did a 20,000 pound investigation. The potential impact of that cost saving of 20,000 pounds could translate to almost a million pounds for one out of every five projects. Or if you average it out, about 200,000 pounds per month on average for all projects. And that's the magic number. That's what puts this whole thing into, into context. A one rand saving on a geotechnical investigation could cost you at the end of the day, 10 to 40 times that. And that's why it's so important to involve and bring the geotechnical practitioner into the project as early as possible and to make sure that the appropriate and adequate investigation is carried out for the uh, particular development. Now, this sounds all onerous, but let me uh, give you some examples of the symptoms of a sick industry. So there in 1983, the National Economic Development Office, and these are all UK based, did a survey of 5,000 indus industrial buildings. Of those, 50,000 overran by at least a month. Uh, sorry, not 50,000, 50% half overran by at least one month. So overrunning on the program is the norm. 75% of the overruns were due to ground problems. In 88, the National Economic Development Office again uh, did another survey of 8,000 commercial buildings. 33% overran by more than a month. And another 33% up to a month. 50% of those overruns were due to unforeseen ground conditions. Unforeseen because of inadequate investigation. And then a little bit more recent, 2001, the National Audit Office uh, did a survey of public projects in, the, in, in cities and found that 70% were delivered late and 73% overran the tender price. Something is seriously going wrong. It is going so wrong that in the UK, Her Majesty's Treasury publishes what is called the Green Book. <laughs> and it's meant to give advice on optimism bias. 
and that's just the English the way of um, putting it nicely. That should be read as the tendency for project costs and works duration to be underestimated. This is a formal manual that is published by the Treasury that tells you by how much you must make allowance for a project to overrun either on cost or actually both cost and time. If you read the Green Book, you'll find that the main causes of this bias derives from a poor definition of scope and objectives and poor management of the project during implementation. Uh, just an excerpt from this manual uh, gives us some percent percentages there, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this slide. I'll, I'll show you another slide just shortly, which speaks to exactly the same thing. All right, that brings me to the first critical reference or essential reference uh, for your bookshelf, and that's the South African Code of Practice for Site Investigations, published by SISI. Uh, the first edition of it was published in 2010. I believe that it is currently under review, but it is the, the, the first edition is available for download at the Geotechnical Division's website, and I've given you the web link uh, where you can access it. This document is issued as a code of practice and a guideline, and it was developed by the people for the people. The committee that sat in drafting this comprised members of the Geotechnical Division of SISI and members of the Engineering Geologist Society. It is the yardstick for site investigations. It was developed to assist us in doing our work, to educate our clients and to set a reference or a benchmark. But beware, it can also become a stick to hit you with. I've just highlighted there uh, in the first figure of this um, of this code of practice. Uh, the first thing that it says there is appoint a geotechnical specialist at the earliest possible date. And when project managers and uh, clients agents start applying this pearl of wisdom, I think a lot of the things that go wrong and result in delays and cost overruns will be mitigated. In this document, there is a table that comes from the work of Rowe in 1972, and it ties up uh, with what we've seen from, from Tim's example, actually. Uh, looking at that table, we see there that the geotechnical investigation should cost somewhere between 1 to 2% of the main works. So if we're looking at a 10 million rand house, the cost of the investigation should be around about 100,000, maybe 200,000 rand. So maybe it's an opportune time and I'm going to show the results for our survey. And um, if someone will just give me uh, an indication in the in the live chat whether you, where you can see the results. So from 61 participants, the average of our example comes at about, let's say that's five, six, seven, about 80,000 Rand and should take about six weeks to complete. And that 80,000 fits in very nicely into this bracket of about, let's say, 0.8% to 2% of the development cost. So, the second piece of literature that I would encourage you to to, to get. And again, what is uh, really helpful about this is that the authors, uh, Chris Clayton, uh, Matthews and Simons, made, has made this uh, document or handbook available online free of charge. Uh, it's called Site Investigation, the Engineer's Handbook. And um, it's one of those essential references that deals with all the aspects of site investigation from the planning and procurement stages all the way through to the end, uh, putting up monitoring and instrumentation, etc. It's a really good read and it contains a, a wealth of valuable information. 
And I encourage you strongly, especially the young engineers out there, to obtain a copy of this. I've provided you with the, the web link uh, where you can access it. So I think before we move on to the next section, if there are any questions in uh, on the first section, I'm happy to take them. I will carry on and as, as if there are questions coming up, I will revert back to them shortly. So the next section we're looking at the work that we can do office bound uh, prior to actual uh, activities on site, um, doing it, intrusive investigations, etc. And the whole idea here is to get a look at the big picture. It is looking at the forest before we start focusing on the trees. And I've chosen for, for this part of the, the talk, uh, just a quick look at uh, aerial photograph interpretations and site, site walkover, uh, at the role that Google Earth plays in our lives these days, satellite interferometry, and a little bit on the uh, on national databases. Now, the picture on this slide is uh, a phenomenal uh, geological exposure. Um, I had the privilege many years ago to visit the site with Chris Clayton, and it's at Alum Bay on the Isle of Wight, on the western coast of the Isle of Wight, South UK. And what it is, is an exposure of 50 million years of Cretaceous and tertiary geology that's literally been turned on its side and smacked down on the beach for you to see. So by walking from left to right along that beach section, you are literally walking through geological time from the uh, from about 50 million years ago to uh, 35 million years ago. And you can see all the formations uh, stacked up on their sides uh, as, as you walk along this beach. It's, it's one of those rare and wonderful geological um, places to visit in, in, in the world. And I'm putting it in here just to say that we should never underestimate the value of walking a site. The value of stopping at a cutting on the way to the site um, and literally getting feet on the ground uh, before you get into the hectic activities of undertaking test pits and doing in-situ testing is just to familiarize yourself with the site conditions. Look at the outcrops, look at the cuttings, uh, any excavations that may be there. Look at the state of structures that are erected on the site. Are they cracked or are they, are they in good condition, etc. Not only are you going to get a good feel for the site, but it also provides uh, a good opportunity to assess access conditions for when you want to bring drilling rigs onto the site, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's really one of the, uh, I think, most underestimated activities that can be done. Now, I realize this is not an uh, office-bound uh, exercise, but I, I group it together with the desk study part of things. That first time you set foot on the site is uh, of invaluable um, uh, value, I guess. All right, so one of the questions I did ask you was to rank the priorities of different um, disk study activities, and we can have a look at the results. And there you have it. I'm hoping this is coming up on your screens um, from your own poll. And I had 52 responses there. Uh, I think you are in absolute agreement with the value of the site walk walkover walk activity. Uh, second top of the list, we have geological mapping and publications, old reports, and then topographical mapping, Google Earth, aerial photograph interpretation, and climatic data. And I would tend to agree with this ranking almost to a T uh, with one exception. And I hope to illustrate that to you uh, in the next few slides. And that exception pertains to the aerial photograph interpretation side of things. All right, I believe that APIs are a little bit of a, a dying art. Um, I, in my time at Jones of Wagner, um, have been very privileged to work with Brian Antrobus, uh, our senior engineering geologist for many, many, many years. And I cannot explain to you the value of 
an aerial photograph interpretation that is done by Brian uh, right at the start of a site investigation project. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's something to behold as he would take these stereo pair photographs, one in 10 or one in 30,000 scale under that stereo microscope and these little pencil case of colored pencils and how the geology suddenly starts to appear on these maps. And I've included just as an example on the right hand side there, one of the, the largest sites that Brian interpreted for me. Uh, and I hope that you can see from uh, what he's drawn there, how valuable that information really becomes. Um, you know, if you have no knowledge of the site, the historical knowledge of the site, with a map like that, it becomes fairly easy and straightforward to place, for example, testbed positions. There are a number of features that have been highlighted on this on this map, and it now becomes a, a question of locating enough test pits in those areas to go and verify and prove the, the terrain evaluation and to determine the characteristics of the engineering soils in those areas. Not only that, um, also from these API uh, terrain evaluations, Brian is able to explain or, or to to, to infer where you can go, for example, to look for borrow materials, uh, maybe uh, areas of the site where you can expect uh, development of ferruginous soils, which generally classify perhaps as a G7 type material, etc. So I think this is probably together with walking the site um, and, and geological mapping, the top three activities that can be done in the office uh, and before you start with intrusive investigations that provide best bang for buck. And I'm hoping that from the engineering geologist side, this is not a dying art or a dying trade and uh, that young geologists will still be trained and educated and taught by the older guys and girls how to use this method to derive valuable information from photographs. I'm sure as we go into the future, some of this work may become electronic or digita digital, digital, um, but maybe I'm I'm old school. I still like the fact of someone sitting at that um, stereoscope, looking at the photographs and getting a feel feel for the site. With that kind of information, and, and, and maybe the point I want to bring up with this slide is the tremendous value of working in, a, in an organization, and I'm using Jones of Wagner as, as an example, but I'm sure all the major consultants, uh, the situation will be the same. Uh, Jones of Wagner being just over 50 years old, we have an enormous archive of historical projects, and those job files are a trove of treasure. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times um, we have gone back to these old projects and found information there that is invaluable. The, the map that I've shown in the background there is a, a, a local, how can I put this, is a, a custom, that's the right word, is a custom geological map that was developed by uh, Brian Antrobus and Jeff Matthews way back when by walking the site, uh, mapping exposures, mapping contacts, uh, sub outcrops, outcrops, etc. And many, many decades later, we were able to use this map to develop and design a geotechnical investigation for a fairly large structure. And having access to this kind of information is incredibly useful. And under the uh, guidance of Gavin Wardle, all of these archives are now are now being digitized and there's already a large volume of the old reports and old job files available online. And in a situation like we are at the moment with COVID-19, uh, it is such a pleasure and, and so convenient to be able to log into our service at work and gaining access to some of this information. Just an example of the output of such a, 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 a desk study and terrain evaluation. This uh, information was generated before we even put foot on site, just on historical data, API, and an interpretation of the geology. 
Richard Puchner is currently working in the UK. Um, while he was at Jones of Wagner, he was uh, very keen and interested in how we can use Google Earth as a tool in the desk study process. And he's written two papers, which I've given you the references there, uh, where, in which he explains how he approach, approaches the, uh, the tool of Google Earth and its terrain, uh, topographical mapping of terrain to identify geological uh, features, whether they be contact zones, uh, faults or lineaments of, of some sort. Uh, and it's wonderful how these days you can actually overlay your geological mapping onto Google Earth uh, and, and especially onto the topography of Google Earth and get a much better understanding of what's going on on, on your site. Not only that, um, one of my other interests is, is geomorphology and how that is a key to understanding the materials that you may encounter uh, on a site. And I was so impressed when I read through the recent report that was um, published by the expert panel that undertook the assessment of uh, the failure of the Cadia tailings dam in Australia. And our own uh, John Waits was one of the panel members. And in that report, uh, in fact, these, these images were taken from, from the, 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 the investigation report and they show how geomorphologically the site had developed uh, through the ages and how this understanding of the geological processes have fed into an explanation as to what occurred on, on the site and how to expect the materials to behave, whether they be the weathered products or the, the bedrock components. If we add that understanding of geomorphology to the power of Google Earth, things start to get very interesting. And um, I think we are privileged these days to have access to technology that allow us to do mappings like the one that is currently displayed on the site there uh, fairly easily. Uh, the gaming industry obviously is driving this because gamers obviously uh, insist on photorealistic graphics. And if you're a historical gamer, uh, a historical battle needs to be accurate to the, the most incredible detail. So a lot of the development of these visual tools are being driven by uh, gaming on the one side and by um, BIM on the other side, uh, building information management systems, where clients and engineers are more and more working in a fully interactive three-dimensional environment uh, in bringing to life uh, designs. And just imagine how uh, great it would be if we can take, uh, and, and this is one of my, also one of my key reads uh, and favorite books is by Fuchs and Griffiths, uh, Understanding Engineering Geomorphology. And in this book, they have these models of different geologies. And it's now so easy and simple to translate those models into, for example, a overlay of a Google image uh, in, a, in a topographical uh, sense, like I've showed in the middle there, and then to be able to, in a much better way, understand visually uh, what you can expect on a site like this. This example that I've shown you is just simply uh, this coastal road uh, constructed on a, what I consider to be a very risky slope, but being able to overlay the imagery from Google Earth onto the topography of a site and to be able to manipulate and inspect this from all kinds of angles in three dimensions, I think bring just a whole new dimension to our understanding of, of our environment. Now, the model on the screen there just shows the surface. Imagine what, what how, how much better this is going to be if we start to bring the geological or the ground conditions into these models. And I don't think that's that's far fetched so far far down the line in the future. We are basically at the cusp of being able to produce these models uh, as part of, of of engineering projects. Just as an aside, uh, another example of the value of Google Earth is uh, a, a case where a contractor came to Jones of Wagner and employed one of our senior structural engineers. And the, and the problem was that this contractor was being sued by a no homeowner. And I can't remember the details of the project, but it was either uh, road building or pipe laying, uh, 
uh, in the road, in a public street. And as you would be aware, these big compactors cause quite a bit of vibrations, and those vibrations obviously can cause some damage. And this particular homeowner was suing the client for damage to his property, including damage to his boundary wall. So what our engineer uh, did was to go through the timeline images in, in Google Earth and also to look at the street view photograph of this particular owner's house. And lo and behold, and uh, the image that I'm displaying here is just artificially made up, so it's not real. Don't go and try and find this house in Google Earth. But um, what he found was that even before the construction started, the very same crack that the owner was um, uh, suing the contract on was already evident in the wall. And with that evidence, the whole claim just fell through and the contractor got away there. Another useful tool is um, satellite interferometry, and this is a very interesting technology that has um, come about. And our own uh, Janine Engelbrecht from the CSIR in Stellenbosch is spearheading some of the, the groundbreaking research uh, of this technology. Uh, essentially, what they are doing is they are looking at flight mapping or flight paths of satellites over time. And typically, these uh, flights will be uh, spaced a month apart. And every time a satellite uh, flies across a, a, a flight path, it will take imagery or, or digital readings of, of the topography. And by measuring the phase shift in the angles of these digital pixels, they are able to actually measure uh, movement in the line of sight. Um, what I'm trying to explain here is uh, these measurements are not accurate in level or ele elevation. Uh, they can't tell you that this particular pixel is 1,250 meters above sea level, but what they can do to incredible accuracies is to tell you that between those two passes, that pixel raised or lowered by a millimeter or even parts of a millimeter. And so this technology is currently being used uh, in our office. We've been looking at it uh, for uh, in looking for subsidence due to undermining collapse. And the image on the right hand side shows an example of, I believe, Borden pillar or high extraction mining, where uh, Janine was able to map subsidence over time uh, on, at ground level over these panels. We are also using the service to look for settlement in uh, large dumps and also on the embankments of tailings dams. In fact, in um, the investigation of the Brumadino failure in Brazil, uh, satellite interferometry was used uh, for two things. The left image there shows uh, ground movements at those four spots uh, measured over it looks, I think it was a, a, a period of a year before the actual failure. And it shows that most of the movement, movement actually f took place in the back of the tailings facility against the, the mountain at point B. But they were also able to correlate the movements measured at point C, which is on the embankment that failed, uh, with a mechanism of creep, which is one of the two main reasons uh, issued in the report uh, for the failure of that embankment. Not only that, the images on the right hand side, they were also over a very long period able to map the movement of moisture, obviously as it's expressed at the surface of the, the facility, but the movement of moisture from upstream uh, in the top image towards the embankment as we cascade down to the bottom, bottom in image. And all of these pieces of information were pieces of a puzzle that eventually were put together to explain the reason for that dramatic disastrous and brittle failure of a tailings embankment, which before the time, by all accounts, measurements uh, uh, did not show any signs of distress or at least of, of catastrophic failure. So I guess as we move into the future, our world is going to become more digital and I wouldn't be surprised if virtual or augmented reality starts to play a far greater role in what we do. And in fact, those steps have already been taken uh, by Oricon, uh, where they have been looking at uh, stability assessments of slopes along our national routes. And there's our very uh, own Trevor Pape, uh, 
uh, going about the business of evaluating imagery from driving along these routes in a virtual or augmented reality environment. And in doing this, uh, it's a, a far more effective and efficient screening process to eliminate areas that are of not, not, not of concern and to identify those areas where site investigations or closer inspections are warranted. And I can see that this technology will be, play a far greater role uh, in the near future as, as we develop and become more comfortable with, with the technology. Then lastly in this section, I just want to make a quick mention of national databases. Uh, the UK, the British Geological Society has a tremendous database, all uh, or most geotechnical investigation reports uh, and test results are captured in this database and they or originate from clients, consultants and contractors alike. The bulk of the database is made up of roadworks, the major trunk road developments, uh, but just normal standard investigations, all of that data uh, popular, it gets populated into the database. So I think currently uh, uh, there is something like 5,000 plus project reports being filed, more than 100,000 borals, test pits with logs, in situ measurements, and the results of many, many, many laboratory tests. And being able to access this information through the, the, the society uh, is obviously uh, a great source of information. But in South Africa, we don't stand back for the for the for the British Isles. Uh, our own Council for Geoscience also maintains a national database. And although I was aware of the fact that we had an extensive Dolomites uh, database with more than 5,000 Dolomite stability reports, uh, it was new to me. I was surprised to learn that uh, we also have a very large database of non-Dolomitic reports. Uh, in addition to the reports, there's also a catalog of all the sinkhole events that have been logged. And then as with the British database, many bore rolls, test bits and test results. What I found very interesting is this big patch of purple in uh, uh, just uh, northwest, is it, of Polokwane. I have no idea why that area has been so widely investiga investigated and so many reports in uh, logged with uh, with the with the council. Uh, maybe someone can pop into the chats if uh, into the chat section if they are familiar with this area. Uh, I do know that there are some platinum mines towards the south, but for the greater part of that area, I am very interested to understand why it uh, has been investigated and filed into our Council of Geoscience Data database. So really, all of that without even getting your boots wet. And I think we uh, undervalue the contribution of a site walkover and of a proper desk study uh, as part of normal site investigation practice. And if there are any questions, I'll keep my eye on the screen here to my right. Otherwise, I will go on to the next section, which looks at our relationship with the law. Uh, much of this work uh, I've taken from the EXA notice that have been published uh, by some notable authors, amongst them Peter Day. And um, But before we go there, let's have a look at your um, estimate of the value of a human life. All right, there's a very interesting result. So it's all over the place, not a clear bell curve, not a normal distribution with quite a few answers to what's the left, less than a million. But it seems that the average is averaging out at about 8.2 million US dollars. All right, and I want to show you why I've been asking this question. It's basically to do with the science of stupid. So if you're a government or a legislator, You've got two responsibilities. The one is to look after your people and the other one is to make sure that the country as a business makes money. So how do they go about this? Um, as a government, and I'm using an example from the United States here, uh, they have to estimate or put a number to the value of a human life. Now, depending on from which direction you're looking at this, you can get 
quite a large range of different numbers. The Environmental Protection Agency in 2016 put a value to a human life of about 10 million US dollars. That's very close to the average that um, our voters came up with. But it can drop down to two and a half million, which equates to the average lifetime earnings of a college graduate, university graduate. Uh, maybe 2.2. This is what juries tend to award um, for a wrongful death. The 9-11 settle, settlement uh, compensation ran at about 1.7 million US dollar. The average life insurance policy about 160,000 and the net worth of a US household about 80,000. So why all these numbers? How do they feature? What, what makes them important? Well, it works like this. In 28, 2008, the uh, Department of Transport in the USA had to make a decision. They had to decide whether they were going to make it compulsory for auto manufacturers to install a rear seatbelt warning system. In other words, that irritating beep that tells you that the seatbelt is not plugged in. So they went about it this way. So they said in 2008, at that time, the value of a statistical life was about 6.5 million. They reckoned um, from statistics that 44,000 lives are lost annually due to not wearing a rear seatbelt. And that equates to a risk of 280 million for the government. On the other hand, if the auto manufacturers had to install these warning systems, it would come out to a cost of about 330. So in 2008, it didn't make much sense to pass that kind of legislation. But by 2016, the cost of not having those buzzers uh, outweighed the cost of implementing uh, the warning system by the auto manufacturers and I understand that that was then legislated and became part of regulation. And uh, just for interest, if uh, you want to know the value of your own life and this was uh, a survey that I did, you go to humans for sale and they ask you a large number of very embarrassing questions and at the end of the day it comes up with an estimate. So in 2015, it seems like my life was worth about 1.85 million and it's come down to 1.65 million uh, as of this year. So I guess that gives us an indication of what age does to one's uh, value. Uh, and this is comparable to the value of your life on the black market. All right, so let's look. We, we now understand where, it, where this legislation comes for and what the purpose of it is. So there are two p two different types of regulatory, uh, can I call them codes? The, the first is the mandatory standards. Those are the acts that are promulgated by parliament legislation. But be careful, any document that is specified in a contract to be part of the project attains the same status as an act. From our regulations, the first one that is of importance is the National Building Regulations and Building Standards Act, Act 103 of 1997. And that states in Section F3 that a geotechnical site and environmental conditions need to be assessed. The investigation uh, and investigation is required on contaminated land and on sites with problem soils. It further states that a competent person must be appointed to undertake these investigations. And this is my first can of worms. Uh, what is a competent person? And I'm not going to open that Pandora's box today. It then further states that if you are on a dolomitic site, your investigation will be in accordance with SANS 10400B, or if it's on another other site with other problem soil conditions, it has to comply with 10400H. So the act is mandatory and by specifying the two SANS uh, codes, they are also included as part of the act. You as an, uh, a practicing professional will be measured against these stipulations. The second part of legislation that, uh, that applies to us is the Housing Consumer Protection Act, Act 95 of 1998. Section two, it, said it made provision for the establishment of the NHPRC, which is a juristic person, which means that the NHPRC has rights and obligations. One of the obligations that it has is to publish the Home Building Manual, which it has, 
And that manual also calls for the appointment of a competent person to classify soil conditions. It also specifies the use of SANS 1936 for work on dolomitic land. Okay, but let's look at another one that's a little, maybe a little bit more interesting. The Occupational Health and Safety Act and the construction regulations that accompany it is also enacted. One of the first things that I want you to think about is the fact that, and this is my interpretation of it, test pitting is seen as construction work, despite the fact that you may be a professional or a consultant. So the law is likely to see you as a contractor when you are doing test pitting. So the question is, are you adequately insured for this kind of work? And I don't think there are clear answers to this question. Um, at Jones and Wagner, what we have done is we have approached our insurers, our professional indemnity insurers, and they have written a special clause into our insurance contract to cover us for uh, test pitting as a professional activity. So um, I, I don't have the, the clause with me, but um, it, it has been specifically written into the PI insurance policy to cover us for test pitting and um, doing that kind of work, which is seen as can be seen as construction work on a site because PI will not cover you for that work where you are acting as a contractor. Something else to consider is that in Section three of the construction regulations, there's a requirement to notify the uh, provisional director and to obtain, excuse me, a permit for construction work within 30 days in advance. And then there's some conditions that when, when you shouldn't, when you have and don't have to do it. But even if, if, if the client, and this is the client's responsibility, even if the client does not have to apply for a permit, then in section four, it says, if an apply, uh, uh, application was not lodged for a construction permit, you, and that's the contractor, must notify the provincial director seven days in advance of any excavation work. And test pitting is seen as excavation work. Uh, the reason why I'm <clears throat> hammering on this point is, is that in, later in a, in a sort of a pictograph, I'm gonna show you the concept of what I consider to be stacking the probabilities. And these things can either act for you or against you. So at Jones and Wagner, we, our safety um, consult, not consult, our safety employer or employee, um, Karin Gruvier, she is on top of these things. So when we go out for a site investigation that includes test pitting, she uh, will apply for these permits, either the permit of construction or the notification of excavation work. And that's just another tick on the right side of the balance. Over and above that, you have to prepare a health and safety plan. That's not a client requirement. Yes, clients do require us to do safety plans, and health, health and safety plans, but it is a legal mandatory requirement by the OSH Act and the construction regulations. So my question to you earlier was, how deep are you allowed to enter into an excavation without bracing or battering? And here are the answers, and I hope that you can see them. By far the majority of um, the 60-odd eight participants, and votes are still coming in, uh, voted for 1.5 meters. And I know where this comes from. Many years ago, the legislation was written around a depth of 1.5 meters, and I, I speak under correction, but I think even now the, uh, the regulation in regard to working at heights uh, scaffolding, etc., is still pegged around 1.5 meter. It's wrong. It's definitely not three meters. It's not one and a half meters. It's also not 1.1 meters, and it's not waist level. It's not even 0 0.1 meter. So if I go back to my slide, this is construction regulation 13, safety of excavations. And I'm just going to read the, the highlighted sections to you because this is what it's all about. A contractor who performs excavation work may not require or permit any person to work in an excavation, read test bit, which has not been adequately shored or braced, 
provided that shoring and bracing may not be necessary where. Now you see no, no mention of any depth, no specification of depth in this whole uh, section. They have taken the 1.5 and I believe for a very short time there was a 1.1 meter specification that's all taken out. Currently as it stands, you are not allowed to enter an excavation of any depth unless battered or braced unless, uh, and here comes the next section. Point B1 says the sides of the excavation are sloped to the maximum angle of repose measured to the horizontal plane, so that's battering. Next point, point two. Unless such an excavation is in stable material, and how do we know that it's stable? Provided that permission has been given in writing by the appointed competent person. So here comes the competent person again, the can of worms. And that competent person must give permission in writing that it's safe to enter the excavation or the test pit. And on the left hand side, I've put there a little icon. I call it, um, uh, let's call that the com competent person. He's person number one. If you read the act carefully, it actually mentions two persons. So firstly, the competent person looks at the excavation, makes an assessment, signs it off in writing as safe to enter. Section BB then goes on, where any uncertainty pertaining to the stability of the soil still exists after the competent person is at look at, look at it. The decision from a professional engineer specified or a professional technologist, uh, to technologist competent in excavations is decisive, and such a decision must be noted in writing signed by both the competent person contemplated in one and the professional engineer of technologies, as the case may be. So I read this section as referring to two persons, the competent person in the first place and the professional person competent in investigations. And I think the reason for this comes from contracting work. If you are a contractor installing trenches, you will probably have your competent persons running around at the trenches. They will be trained and experienced in stability of trenches, and they will make the run of the mill day to day evaluations of the safety of the trench. If that person is uncertain, you will run to the office or phone the engineer and say, listen, I'm worried about this section of trench. Can you please come and have a look at it? When we are doing test pitting, we don't have the benefit of access to two types of competent persons. And certainly at Jones and Wagner, in my experience, we tend to make use of professionals competent and appointed by the CEO uh, as competent persons in excavations to undertake this part of um, the regulation of, of, of our legislation, mandatory le le legislation. All right, on that heavy note, let's look at some of the other things. The construction regulations go further and they say that the role and the, the responsibility of the competent person is amongst other. Now look at this, supervise the excavation work, evaluate the stability, we've seen that, prevent engulfment, obvious, prevent surcharges, that's placing the spoil heap next to the side of the excavation, a safe means of access and egress, safeguard any buildings or services next to the, to the to excavation, provide warning signs, test the air quality, and the list goes on and on and on. And again, I'm gonna come back to the stacking of the pro probabilities um, idea. So remember some of these things. So, personally, I am sometimes responsible for making the written appointments as delegated by the CEO of competent persons under my um, management at Jones and Wagner, let's put it that way. So what I've done is to set a bar for, for young engineers and engineering geologists, and it, it's made up of the following requirements. Professional registration. So either a PRN, SINAT, ENG tech or tech, technician. So first requirement is for professional registration. I do that because it shows a certain amount of responsibility and dedication to your profession. Secondly, I want to see a logbook of your field experience. So every time a young engineer or geologist goes out to site, he's got a little printed booklet 
And I'll show you an example of that shortly where they fill in the details and the person responsible on site, the competent person, signs that little sheet. And these young engineers build up a file of these sheets of site investigation experience. I want to see experience in different geologies. And typically what they do is uh, populate a Google Earth KMZ file with pin, pin marks all over the country and wherever they've gained experience in different geologies. Attendance of training events such as today's lecture or some of the lectures that are presented by SAIC. And then lastly, a letter of recommendation from the person's immediate supervisor who's come to know him, has spent time with that person on site and has advised her throughout the development. All of this information is, gets put together in a package, uh, reviewed, signed off, and the appointment made, stacking the probabilities. So here's some examples, what I call our get out of jail free cards. So you read there that the construction regulations requires signage at excavation. So at Jones and Wagner, we've got these clapper boards and you throw it in the back of the bucky when you're on site next to the test, but just put up the sign. It says caution men in excavation. Ticks that box. We also have a record with every site file in every person's um, uh, toolbox. And in there, it's got provision to uh, note in writing and sign off each test bit that gets entered. So for each test bit, you can see there in the background, uh, there's date, time, test bit number, the results of the inspection, either safe to enter or not safe to enter, and signed off by the responsible person on site stacking the probabilities. Then a little training record, that's that sheet, uh, just as an example to show you uh, what, what uh, goes on to that. And these things together, as I said, make up your personal file of your knowledge, experience, and training, which culminates in a appointment from the CEO as per my or your senior um, recommendation. Right, that brings us to question five. And my question was, as a practicing geoprofessional, what are your risks? Are you uh, at risk for civil actions, in contract, in delict, criminal actions, and imprisonment, or even death penalty? Let's have a look. All right, so a nice even spread of all of those, except the death penalty, like almost 30% for civil contractual, civil delictual, criminal and a 2% vote for 3% uh, vote for death penalty as the votes keep on coming in. Uh, I think that's a fair representation. Um, so what I will do if I can get the right screen up is so I'm going to skip this slide and I'm going to go to my pictographs. All right, so let's have a look at these different actions against the, the geo practitioner. So in private law, the law of obligations, you could have a civil action against you, either in contract or in delict. And this part of the law is aimed at balancing the equities. It's not the law of punishment. It's the law to ensure that fair and equal uh, practice is ongoing. If the party, the law is very um, serious about honoring the intentions of contracting parties. In fact, the law actually allows contracting parties to write out a, some, some of the legislation. You can agree in your contract that this piece of legislation does not apply to the work and the law will honor that. Obviously, legislation such as the Health and Safety Act, you cannot write out in, in contract, but some of it you can. So the law is very serious about honoring your intentions or your um, agreements in contract and this part of civil proceedings is there to make sure that this goes uh, carries on in a fair and equitable manner so the the tipping point of the scale is the balance of probability so if you're ever involved in litigation you will hear the lawyers talk about the balance of probabilities and it's not an engineering or mathematical balance the law will not look at the scale and says if it's 51% to the right, you win. And if it's 49 to the left, the person on the left loses. The law doesn't work in precise numbers like that. It will consider and make a value decision of whether that scale is tipped to the one or the other side. And for this kind of action, they will look at the balance of 
of probabilities, whether it's leaning a little bit more to the one side than to the other side. The parties here are typically on the left, uh, your client, which is generally a company, and it will be represented by, for example, a project manager or an architect as its agent. On the right hand side is you, the geo practitioner and your boss or the company for which you work. And there's a part of our law that comes from the Dutch Roman law, which says that your employer is actually also vicariously liable for your actions. And this will be outside of contract. So where you in the line of your employment hurt or injure another person, that person will not sue you. It will sue your company for vicarious liability. And that's a principle in law that say that uh, sort of recognizes the fact that um, the company has far deeper pockets than you have. And the person that has been wronged will have a far better chance of recovering losses against your employer than against you. All right, so on the left hand side, what are you up against? So first of all is the contract document itself, but also legislation like we've seen now and the common law principles. You will also have codes of practice, and this is where the site investigation code of practice will be on that side of the scale. And that's why I say don't let it be a stick to hit you. Rather put that code of practice on your side of the scale by stacking the probabilities in your favor. Do the work according to the site investigation code of practice or have a very good reason why you are not doing it that way and be able to defend it. And lastly, you will be up against uh, what in the law is called the bonus pater familias or the reasonable person. But because we are professionals, that reasonable person is elevated to the rank of reasonable expert. And those are the experts that will be um, providing opinion and witnessing in a typical court case or arbitration. On your side, you have to stack the probabilities uh, first of all, by making provision for incidents through insurance, whether that be professional indemnity insurance or contractors or risk insurance, by the company uh, stipulating rules and policy of good practice and safe practice, uh, just encouraging best practice all the time and through training and supervision of its employees. And this is the delicate balance that will be um, looked at and evaluated in a private civil action. And that's why I'm saying rather stack the probabilities in your favor by abiding by the site investigation code of practice and doing the simple things that will tick off the requirements of the construction regulations and the Health and Safety Act. But you can also be held li liable in a criminal action. Now, a cr criminal actions are there actually to punish the wrongdoer. And that's why the party on the left is always going to be the state. It's going to be the state that accuses uh, you, the practicing engineer, of a wrongful act that is punishable either with a fine or is alternatively punishable by imprisonment. And the measured, uh, it's measured against legislation like the Health and Safety Act, the common law and the reasonable expert. And, and a simple example um, here is um, incidents in uh, trench engulfment, uh, but also uh, let's let's move on to the next slide. The three percent that voted for the deaths, and now I think the, the the risk of such a penalty being applied is very small. However, there's one thing that makes me very worried here, and it's it's the same thing as as oh sorry, I want to go back to 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 criminal actions. Uh, the the measure of balance has now moved from a balance of probabilities to beyond reasonable doubt. So it's a much harder thing to prove than just a normal uh, civil action. So criminal requires a greater measure of imbalance compared to a normal civil action. When we move on to something like a death penalty, the, the balance is beyond a shadow of doubt if we can use that expression. Uh, and I th although I think this is a small risk, what I want to make you aware of, and if you look at the picture of the globe there, all the countries in red in that picture still has legislation that makes it allow permissible to execute 
or uh, give the death death sentence and execute a person and who actively uh, does executions. And if you go to the to, to the Wikipedia, you can actually see, I think, uh, Egypt in Africa is an example of a country that um, I don't want to say regularly, but there's a number of incidences over the last few years where persons were executed. And look there, our neighboring country of Botswana actually is one of the red countries. The, the next color there that's of significance is, is the orange. And those are countries that, although they have legislation in place that allows uh, the death penalty, uh, they do not actively enforce it. But I think it's just important to be aware that if we are working outside the borders of our own country, in, Af in our African neighbor states, that you are aware of these types of risks. And maybe I want to, I, I know I'm going to run horribly out of time here, um, but just an example, I, I was doing a project in Nigeria and the contractor had a, num a number of young uh, guys on site to do supervision works. And one of these young boys uh, fell in love with a local and broke curfew at night, took a work bucky, drove to the adjacent village and ran over and killed uh, a person, a pedestrian on the road. You do not want to be in that situation. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. How serious is this? Well, if uh, this slide speaks for itself. In both America and in the UK, um, people have been imprisoned or sentenced to jail uh, for trench engulfments, for deaths in collapsed trenches. All right, lastly in this section, um, we spoke about mandatory uh, legislation, um, but there are also guides of good practice that pertains to geotechnical investigations. And um, I've just listed them uh, there. I think you are aware of those, but uh, just in case, I think it's it's always a good thing to be um, to be aware of what uh, documents out there will be used or can be used as a measure of uh, good and best practice as far as site investigations go. All right, um, Brett, I am running out of time. Um, and I, I foresee, foresaw this, um, and, and that's why I did ask Brett if it would be okay if we do not have sufficient time to go through all of these slides to be able to have a second session to finish off the last two parts. And uh, he said he doesn't see any problem from the Geotech Division side, and certainly from my side, I'd be more than happy to follow up and to complete the next two sections, which deal specifically with test pitting and also with the act, act of, of, of sampling, the more practical side of things um, compared to the more legal and, and document side of things that I have discussed today. But hopefully um, I've given you something to think about uh, when you pack your bucky and get ready to go out to site. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Fumilin. Uh, I think uh, this was a really, really interesting and entertaining lecture. Um, I think, yes, uh, from the, the geodive side, we can definitely look at putting together a second part of this uh, evening, afternoon lecture. And um, I will chat to the, the chairman and secretary. I, I don't foresee any issues with it. I'm, I think it'll be really good to have a, a session two, if we can call it that. Um, okay, so uh, basically from, from myself and behalf of GeoDiv, thank you very much for putting this together. I, I know it's a lot of time and effort, but uh, we really, really do appreciate it. Um, it looks like uh, we, we are about our 90 minute mark. We've maybe got <laughs> two minutes left, but uh, I would say may, maybe we can take two or three questions uh, from the attendees if there is anything. And, um, you, you know, may, maybe let's look at five minutes of questions and after that we'll close out if, if that suits you. Perfect. Thanks, um, Brett. No problem with that. What I'll leave on the screen there is, is one of the slides from the next section, which uh, shows you my my idea of what the geotechnical practitioner's toolbox should look like from tier one to tier four. But yes, um, I'm happy to answer uh, to try and answer any questions. So I'll keep an eye on the Q&A uh, for anything that comes up. Perfect, thanks. OK, so to, to the attendees, uh, please uh, p post questions if you got them, um, and Dr. Familian will try answer.
Okay, Nico, I see a, a few questions being posted. Can, can you see them on your side? Oh, sorry, I wasn't scrolling down. My, my apologies. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right. All right, um, let's go to, uh, I've published one. So it asks there, is there a standard or a guideline for determining how many boreholes and how deep these should be on a particular site? What limits the depth we should drill uh, boreholes? Uh, good question. And partly answered, or, or I guess fully answered in the site investigation code of practice. In fact, there's a table in the, in the code that uh, makes a suggestion of what the number of investigation points should be for different kinds of developments. I think it looks at um, linear developments like roads, railways, uh, pipelines. It looks at compact developments like towers, uh, tanks, things like that. It looks at residents and industrial buildings and so on. And for each of those, it suggests for a preliminary uh, investigation how many data points you should be looking at, either per structure or per area, and uh, and and then going on to design level investigation, how, how many points are required. But there's also uh, a section that then goes further to explain uh, what are the principles that you take into account when designing a geotechnical investigation, because it's it's virtually impossible to hang all your, um, your design on a table like that. Uh, the variability of the ground conditions come into play and um, the complexity of the, the, the geology comes into play. The occurrence of problem soils are, are really uh, something that you have to take into account. How deep should you uh, investigate? What I can tell you and what you should never do is uh, do a pile design on a TLB test pit. And as crazy as that sounds, uh, I am ashamed to say that it is a regular occurrence in, in, our, in our industry. Perhaps not not as much um, in more recent years, but certainly uh, something that is that is 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 really not 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 on. Um, to answer that question is you have to look at the geology, you have to understand the ground conditions, and secondly, you also have to take into account, and this is something that comes out in the in the next sections of the presentation, is the depth of influence of your structures. Uh, a large area structure will have a much deeper influence. A very a, a small contact area structure, like for example, the wheel of a truck, has only got a very small contact patch, and therefore a limited depth of influence. So you have to design and uh, your investigation to address the requirements in line with the geological conditions and the development uh, envisioned, uh, if I can put it that way. I've got a comment um, from, from Trevor Pipe. Um, he says here, and I'll, uh, let me publish it. Um, hey, where is it now? Published. Comment, API is more effective with bigger sites in mainly greenfields area. Interpretation more difficult in smaller brownfield sites. I, I agree, Trevor, I think that's a, that's a fair comment. Um, Obviously, once you have development on the site, you're obscuring the natural lay of the land, if I can put it that way, or the topography, and certainly uh, the value of an API in that regard is, is more limited. All right, um, I've got a comment from Nino saying, uh, just to remind me to mention the JCC data bank. Now, I'm going to be embarrassed uh, to say, you know, that I'm not aware of this, but I will certainly look into it. Um, I'm assuming that that's the Joburg City Council data bank of information. So another valuable source of info when you embark uh, on, on an investigation. Uh, Nico, I've, yes. I've got a comment and a question here as well. Um, Go for it. Okay, the comment is agreed. A second session would be great. Thanks to Nico for a very informative lecture. The lecture began by highlighting the financial value of GI. Is this something you feel you still have to convince the clients of? Yes. Um, it's difficult because 
who do you convince? Who do you need to convince? Is it the client or the project manager or the client's agent? Where, where, where is the disconnect really happening? And if from certainly in my, and this is my personal opinion, I think a lot of damage is being done when project managers are trying to sell developments with a program and a budget that they know is insufficient or they don't understand and therefore are not aware of the fact that they that, that this project can never be done in that time within that budget and i think uh, but this, it's 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 i guess it's you you can't you can't change this until the the effects of it becomes more um, hurtful, I guess, is the right uh, the right way of saying. It. In in South Africa, we are fortunate for very large parts of our country to not have problem soil conditions and generally fairly competent residual soils. So nine out of ten times, you may get away with a very rudimentary or even no geotechnical investigation by applying standard foundation solutions. But that one out of ten times is when the damage is ten to forty times the the, the benefit uh, and uh, yeah, I, I don't really have an answer. This is a perpetual problem. It's certainly been part of the geotechnical division discussion since I started attending meetings and I think it will form part of it um, for many, many years to come. Um, I've got a, an answer here from Anonymous pertaining to the database, the Council for Geoscience and that uh, pink blotch in the northwest. It says here, the reason for high density of C, a GCS data in the Mokopane area is because of an existing mine called Mokalakwena. I suspect that they share a lot of the monitoring data uh, with the council and the area has a f uh, is also underlain by dolomitic land. Okay, Nico, um, right. I, I think just looking at the time, um, mm. I, I think it's probably time to call an afternoon. They're actually, they're, there's not too many questions that I can see. So no. you know, always a always a sign of a good lecture and there's not too many questions. So, so well done for that. Um, what, what we will do in the meantime, uh, just for everyone's information, I, I will sit with uh, Jacobus and, and John, or well, not sit with them, I'll do it over Teams, but uh, we will start to arrange the second session. And um, again, we will send out an invite. We, we have the, the email addresses of everyone who has RSVP'd, but we'll also put it out on a, on a memo from GeoDiv. So even if uh, people weren't able to join tonight, um, I did get some emails that load shedding was happening. So, you know, the, the invite was still guard to, to all GeoDiv members. All right, so I, I think uh, that, that's all we have time for today. Uh, for the attendees, um, this lecture will be posted onto the, the GeoDiv website. Um, it, it will be uploaded in probably a, a couple of days, maybe give it a week or two. Uh, so you will be able to view it there. And with that, there will be a, a short survey that is posted with it. Um, really just if you can uh, go through that survey, just it's helping us improve things the way we're doing it this way. So it, it would be very helpful. All right. Um, from the GeoDiv side, okay, we're going to look at session number two, but the next evening lecture we're looking at uh, will be from Dr. Lakshmi, and that's in about two months' time, middle of September. So we will also send out uh, that invite uh, with enough uh, notice, so please keep a lookout for that. So um, again, Nico, um, thank you very much for putting this together. Uh, on behalf of myself, GeoDiv, and everyone who's attended, I think uh, a really, really big thank you for, for giving us your time today. It's just a pleasure. And uh, if uh, it, uh, we do have an opportunity to carry on, I'm looking forward to what now becomes the more practical and fun part of, uh, of site investigations. Perfect, looking forward to it. OK, so that's it um, to all the attendees. Thank you for joining us this uh, afternoon. Um, have a great evening further and keep safe.
and uh, bye for now. Cheers from my side.